Hello to everyone. Hey, Ma Lakshmi, Murli. Hey. All right. So this is um, an embryology topic. So for this questions from the region embryology. So I hope you all have uh, studied the. I hope you all have studied the head and neck embryology, especially the pharyngeal arches. Okay, pharyngeal arches, pouches, all this is are uh, all these are very very important. So important. All right. So here you are watching an academy with me. I'm Dr. Roini, and I'm an MD from KMC Kasturba Medical College, Bangalore, which is located in Karnataka. All right, so here I also have a PhD from Savita University, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, and I also have degrees from USA, MT, and MBA in hospital administration. Okay, so I worked as administrator at a hospital by name, Rockingham Memorial Hospital, that is located Harrisonburg, USA. Okay, Harrisonburg. All right, so this is uh, an academy and you are welcome to this and we are going to learn some embryology now, okay? I hope my voice is audible and uh, the picture I've kept it very dim because the otherwise the screen overpowers always, okay? All right, so let me just click to increase the volume. Okay, so here we have development of So it's important for all the people who are going to be in, uh, you know, dental uh, stream also very, very important because they have to know the head and neck development, especially the face development and all those who are, uh, you know, aspiring to be the uh, surgeons, head and neck surgery, rhinoplasty, all these things, they will have to know the embryology of the head and neck very clearly. All right. So now there are two important tissues. You should remember there are two important tissues that are involved in the development of the nose and the face. What are the two important tissues? One is the pharyngeal arches. And these pharyngeal arches are always backed up by the neural crest cells. Okay. So now mainly the pharyngeal arches are the ones, there are six of them. There is first arch. They should be written in Roman numerals. There is Arches. Now, all these arches are backed up by the neural crest cells. Neural crest cells, they give rise to various structures in the body. So, one of the important um, uh, structures it backs up is the pharyngeal arches. So, let's look at neural crest cells also. What do they give rise to? Someone has questions. I'll come to that. This is just first slide. Pharyngeal arches. Now, neural crest cells will come to what are they, where they are present. We'll talk about it. All right. So now, here, neural crest cells are what are they? Now, these are the specialized cells, okay, where they are originating from. They are from the neuroectoderm, okay, neuro, neuroectoderm, neuroectoderm. I'll tell you what is neuroectoderm and from where it came, I'll tell you. It is part of the ectoderm and I'll tell you about neuroectoderm in little more detail okay now so now here as the neural tube is formed the cells from the lateral border of this neurectoderm they just displaced they are just displaced and they are displaced into the mesoderm as well and from there what happens to them they migrate throughout the body to make various other structures so it contributes to various other structures there is a list of structures it contributes to we'll talk about all that and in relevance to head and neck structures, if you just take it, because we are talking about embryology of the head and neck alone, if you take up that, it mainly helps in all these pharyngeal arches and to help with their uh, with their derivatives. So all those derivatives that you get from pharyngeal arches, that is one arch, second arch, third, fourth, and the sixth arch. So all these arches, they also have the essence of contribution from neural crest cells okay so now here look at this one that is internal 
or inner cell mass, not internal, inner. That is called the inner cell mass. ICM is called inner cell mass. You know that the cell after it is turned into blastocyst. Okay, that is about 64 cell stage and about fifth day this is of fifth day this is okay fifth day cell and then here what happens the blastocyst will have a big vacuole in the center that is called blastocyte and it starts differentiating it will have an outer layer of cells which are called trophoblastic cells an inner layer of cells called the this is the trophoblastic cells an inner layer of cells called the embryoblast or the inner cell mass okay that is the inner cell mass now this outer one give rise to the placenta trophoblast will give rise to placenta okay now the inner one whatever is inside inner one whatever is inside that will give rise to various other structures. Now we'll start differentiating into all those germ layers and all those other structures to turn it in, turn itself into an embryo. So when it turns into an embryo, definitely you need ectoderm, endoderm, and the mesoderm. So now all this is by the inner cell mass. Now you can see there is first primitive endoderm that is formed, primitive ectoderm that is formed. Then from endoderm you have visceral endoderm, parietal endoderm and later on with the ectoderm you have gastrulation happening and gastrulation will give rise to the germ layers. Okay, gastrulation is a process by which you get all these germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm and the mesoderm. Now, the primitive ectoderm will give rise to the definitive ectoderm and that differentiate into neurectoderm and surface ectoderm. The name itself tells you here, neurectoderm. So something to do with the neural crest cells, which give rise to various other cells in the PNS, ENS, and also the cartilages and bones, and also importantly, melanocytes. So all these are derivative of the neural crest cells okay they are present throughout the body and it will not just stop at that it will also give rise to the other structures and contributes to the pharyngeal arch derivatives all right so here you can see cns cns this is neural crest and this is cns now this is how it is and pharyngeal arch derivatives you can see and this is the surface ectoderm, epidermal or surface ectoderm. Now here it is definite mesoderm, definitive endoderm, and you can see muscle, bone, connective tissue, blood, vasculature, etc. in the mesoderm. And definitive endoderm, GIT, then, you know, endocrine glands, all these things. Now we are not worried about the endodermal derivatives or the mesodermal. We'll talk only about the ectodermal derivative that is neurectoderm and the surface ectoderm even the surface ectoderm we don't want to talk about it now because we are only concerned right now with the neurectoderm which gave rise to the neural crest cells okay neural crest will give rise to all these cell derivatives because they are scattered throughout the body now so this is how you can see there is neural plate then there is neurocord and the formation of the neural tube from the neural plate and look at all these cells how they migrate neural crest cells and these are the various cells that are derived from the neural crest cells okay so now let's go to the arches now you have so many arches you have the first arch second third and you can see the fourth and the sixth arch now each arch has got set of derivatives, okay, set of structures that is derived. There is an artery, there is nerve and a cartilage. Now if you take up the first arch, you have an artery. For example, if you take, you have the artery that is called the maxillary artery. Then you have nerve that is called the mandibular and you have a cartilage that is called the metal's cartilage. 
okay these are the derivatives of the first part now you can see similarly you have second and you have third and you have fourth and then you have six so these are the different arches that you can identify then you can see that there is this outside this one is the you know pharyngeal cleft okay this one is called the pouch so these are the pouches and these are called the cleft now each is there and each cleft has got certain things that it uh, it gives rise to now let's see so these are the arches and these are the pouches derivatives and you can see this is very important the pouches the first pouch what does it give rise to it gives rise to middle ear auditory tube the second one gives rise to supratonsillar fossa then the third one will give rise to parathyroid which parathyroid and thymus it will give rise to third one will give rise to inferior okay inferior parathyroid and the fourth one will give rise to superior superior is below inferior is above next there are so many arches you saw first one second one third and the fourth one okay out of this the first and second arches are very very important because they give rise to the structures in the face all those facial deformities are because of the defect in the first and the second arch as you can see you have the first arch mandibular arch the name of the cartilage is called meckel's cartilage like that you have hyoid arch name of the cartilage is richards cartilage okay so let's mark this as richards and this one as the meckel's cartilage okay so here the artery is maxillary artery and you have the cranial nerve trigeminal supplying this derivatives from this arch so when you talk about muscles of mastication we always say that it is derived from the first arch so it is supplied by mandibular nerve you will be like why so it is supplied by mandibular nerve it is because the nerve has got a designated group of things to supply the artery has a designated group of things to supply so this maxillary artery is destined to supply only those muscles of mastication and these skeletal derivatives so it will supply this um, malleus is from there incus is from there mandibular ligament and the meckel's cartilage is the cartilage of this arch the first arch and second arches are very very important because these arches many a times they can show defect and one of the important uh, you know a condition that you can see in the defect of this is uh, syndrome is treacher collins syndrome like that you have so many uh, syndromes and we'll talk about all these syndromes in one good uh, you know um, class where i'm going to discuss about all those defects treacher collins syndrome so here the person will have defect in the first and second arches i'm not talking about pouches or clefts i'm talking about arches so here the person have defect in the malleus itself all these ear ossicles malleus incus okay that is from the first one second arch will give rise to the stapes so most of the things are from s if as you can see they are all the derivatives of the second arch so like that you have defect in the first and second arch you can just imagine the person will have complete deformity in the face with all these not developing properly so probably he will have a very small mandible because the mandible muscles of mastication itself is not developed so the person will have very small mandible and muscles of facial expression which is supposed to be present on them are all defective and also the ear ossicles obviously when ear ossicles are not you know patau syndrome patau syndrome also there are see there is list of things uh, that are that is uh, you know uh, uh, that has defects so here this is a classical example i'm giving you classical example where the first and second arch is the only thing that is defective rest of the things are in the in the body are all fine except for the derivatives of the first and second arch okay so like this you have so many syndromes like that so many syndromes and uh, many syndromes will also have associated uh, with the other arch defects 
But this particular one, Preacher Collins, has just defect in these two arches, nothing else. So now here you can see from the third one also you have all these derivatives, fourth one also. But what I want you to observe is the nerve. Okay, nerve of the fourth arch, so important. What is the nerve of the fourth arch? It is vagus. The nerve of the third arch is glossopharyngeal. So you must remember tongue develops from the third, fourth arch also. That's the reason it is supplied by the glossopharyngeal and vagus. Okay, the posterior one third is developing from where? Of the tongue. Tongue posterior one third develops from which arch? It develops from the third arch. That's the reason it is supplied by posterior one third is supplied by the glossopharyngeal, the upper part. Okay, then the caudal part, lower part is supplied by the vagus. That is root of the tongue. Okay, so that is why you have to remember third and fourth are very, very important arches for the development of the tongue. So here you please remember the laryngeal cartilages, they're all supplied by the vagus. Laryngeal muscles are by vagus. Why? Because it is derived from the fourth arch. This is the, actually this is the nerve of this arch. So like that you have transverse arytenoid. Then you have thyroarytenoid, posterior cricoarytenoid. These are some of the muscles of the larynx. Next, let's see the pharyngeal pouches. Pharyngeal pouches are the ones which are, again, separate the pharyngeal arches on the inner side. They're all lined by endoderm. The clefts that are on the outside, they're all lined by ectoderm. So they're called ectodermal pouches, they're called. They're not called endodermal pouches, they're called ectodermal. They're called, inside ones are called the endodermal ones. There are five pouches, and but only four of them are functional in adult life. And see, these are the derivatives of the pouches. If you look at the pouches, these are the derivatives. Now, here you have the first pouch will give rise to eustachian tube and the middle ear cavity. Like that, you have the second one, lining of the palatine tonsil. The third one, dorsal and ventral is there. So dorsal one, inferior parathyroid and ventral thymus. Fourth one, dorsal superior parathyroid and ventrally ultimobranchial arch. See, these things, you have to just memorize it just like that. Just like branches, you have to just memorize them and have a knack to recall them. So because if you go on, you know, uh, digging too much into this, then it becomes even more complicated. All that they ask you is what are the derivatives of the power? Pouches derivative of the arches. So each one, again, in detail to learn, there is a lot of time. So for now, I you know expect fourth one and third one, you please remember very clearly when it comes to the parathyroids. So fourth one, superior. Third one, inferior. Very, very neatly you remember. And also the middle ear cavity, first one. The tonsil is from the second one. Like this, you have to recall. Uh, this is the brachial cyst. Now, cyst is associated with the, you know, not being obliterated second pharyngeal arch. When it will continue to persist and does not give rise to those structures into the adulthood, when it continues to persist, it will result in the bump-like structure called the pharyngeal cyst. Okay, so here you can see the cyst. And it is present on the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So if you notice anything like this, it is not in the parotid region. Parotid is about way up high. So this is in the neck region in front of the sternocleidomastoid. Then you can suspect branchial cyst. Okay, it may swell intermittently and uh, particularly in association with any of those uh, uh, respiratory infections. Okay, because here also there is collection of the fluid and uh, definitely it will change its shape.
So treatment would be to surgical ex excise the cyst and you have to be careful about the nerve that is spinal accessory because this nerve is present supplying the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. So you have to be careful about this one and it is one of the important content of which triangle? Posterior triangle. So listen to this, all this carefully because I'm going to ask you questions now with the MCQs. Now there is again next one, an X-ray which can show you the presence of brachial cyst. Okay, so this is how it would look in the MRI scans. And this is how it will look. It is again cyst is nothing but it is congenital epithelial cyst, and they are present on the lateral side along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. So this is how it would look. Okay, first one. Now you tell me what is the answer. What is the first pharyngeal cleft form? Who will tell me? Mohit, Aisha, Kirti. B external auditory meatus it is correct it is b all right pharyngeal cleft so go back to the chart that i posted and see in that big one where clefts are there it was on that corner you can see the cleft derivatives the first one was auditory meatus what was the second one anybody can recall second one gives rise to Second one gives rise to what? Second cleft. <clears throat> tonsil, pharyngeal tonsil. <laughs> I was I, I read it like Bharat. Bharat. Which pharyngeal arch contributes to Richard's cartilage? Now you tell me this one. Pharyngeal arch, which one contributes to Richard's cartilage? Second one, yes. Second one. Okay. Sanali, tell me which of the following is not associated with fourth arch? You have to tell which is not associated with fourth. I very clearly showed you about the tongue, and I also told you about the tongue development there and what I did not mention there. Is it laryngeal cartilages, superior laryngeal, recurrent laryngeal, aortic arch? Laryngeal cartilages, they're all associated with the sick arch, right? Or fourth arch? This is associated with the fourth arch. Tell me, tell me, tell me now, what is the answer? B, fourth one is, what is four? I don't know. What, why you have written four? The answer is recurrent laryngeal now because this one is associated with the sixth arch. Yeah, right. Now coming to the development of the phase, that is about the pharyngeal arches. Now let's talk about phase development. When does it start? It starts about you know, um, third week of intrauterine life, third to fourth week, and it goes on up to the sixth week of intrauterine life. So here there is a oropharyngeal membrane that is developed and that will just you know, give rise to the, you know, mouth region that is in primitive mouth is called stromadia, stromatodium. Okay, so it initially appears at the site of future phase and it will have ectoderm and endoderm. And you can see there is externally there is ectoderm, internally there is endoderm. And during the fourth week, what happens to this oropharyngeal membrane? Oropharyngeal membrane is the one which later on gives rise to the oral cavity and the pharynx. This is what it gives rise to. Now here it 
later on con continues to develop to become the digestive tract. So now here, this is the one, the membrane right in the center you can see. And you can see the other structures. You can see this one as the frontonasal, frontonasal eminence. And you can see the maxillary. And you can see the lower portion that is mandibular. Okay, so here you can see the lateral nasal. This is the medial nasal process. Lateral nasal and medial nasal, both of these are actually the part of frontal nasal. So altogether there are five, but in some books you'll also see them as three processes. Because these two processes, they will consider that to be part of frontal nasal. So they will just say it is only three process. So when you pick your answer, you just see whether 5 is given or 3 is given. If 5 is given, pick 5. If 5 is not given, 3 is given, go ahead, pick only 3. Okay, 3 is also correct. So now that is the thing. So here you can see lateral nasal, medial nasal, then you can see the maxillary and mandibular. See, there is a cleft that is formed here, right? That has to close. So that will close when... There is a uh, 6th to 12th week of IU life. This is fuses and then it will complete, you know, the palate develops at that time. The secondary palate, primary palate, everything completes its development and it, it, it becomes functional. So now here, if there is a gap that is left behind, then that is known as cleft lip. Tell me what is the reason for cleft lip? Who knows? Tazin, Pankaj, what is the reason for cleft lip? It is non-fusion of which two structures? Non-fusion of this and this. What is non-fusion of M and M is cleft lip. Medial nasal process and maxillary process. Oh yeah. That is M and M's. Okay. What is the reason for oblique facial cleft? Oblique facial cleft happens if there is a gap like this between the medial angle of the eye and the eye is not this one, but yeah, let me not just confuse you. That's not the eye actually. Let me take a better picture. Okay, this also we can't make out. I'll use a different picture. Lateral nasal process and maxillary process. That is correct, but we'll go to the next picture and show you. Yes, here I can show you because it is developed. If there is a gap here, what is that called? That's called oblique facial cleft, okay? That is because of non-fusion of lateral nasal process with the maxillary process. So these two lateral nasal process and maxillary process when they do not fuse that results in oblique facial cleft these two are very very important all these palate and uh, anything to do with the cleft palate cleft lip all that you can make out by the time the baby turns 12th week in the intrauterine life. So by the time you go for your first ultrasound, it should have been developed. That is the key. By the time it is 18th week, 12 to 18th week, it should have been developed. So if there is any cleft lip, it will be easily detected in, its, in their first uh, visit itself. So this is the prominence and these are the derivatives. We have frontonasal giving rise to the, you can just look here, forehead region, the bridge of the nose, bridge of the nose. Okay, very, very important. This is very important. Many people will think it is medial nasal process. It is not. It is frontonasal. Filtrum is from the medial nasal. Very, very important. The gap here, filtrum. That's why the cleft lip Medial nasal is so important because filtrum, having a neat filtrum without any gap between them is medial nasal process contribution. 
And you also know that the four incisors, upper incisors, are developed in the primary palate. Okay, so that primary palate is given by medial nasal process. The first four teeth and the filtrum. So this entire area is by medial nasal process, upper lip. If your upper uh, filtrum is good, if you don't have too much gap between them or it is just perfect, then you should be thankful to medial nasal process. Then there is lateral nasal process that gives rise to sides of the nose, sides of the nose. Then you have maxillary that gives rise to the secondary palate, very important. Primary and secondary palate development is very, very important. So maxillary process will give rise to secondary, the medial nasal will give rise to primary. Which there are sutural lines between on the face? No, there is no sutural lines left. These are processes, these are not bony shells. Okay, if they are bony shells like the hard pellet, then yeah, sutures are there. They are not bony shells, they are soft tissue process. Next one, mandibula, that is first pharyngeal arch that will give rise. It is not bony, it is non bony, it is cartilaginous. Lower lip and jaw. Okay, the mandibular, lower lip and jaw it gives rise to. So only the hard palate, if you're talking about palate, then yeah, later on it will turn into ossification. But what ossification is facial bone, cranial bones? These are all the cranial bones, they're all intramembranous ossification. Okay, keep that in mind, intramembranous ossification. So this is how the primary palate, the secondary palate. So now these two shelves will come and meet in the center and they will leave a gap. So it will look like this. Primary. Then there is like this. Okay, this is the palatine bone. This is the palatine. This is maxilla. Okay, these are the shells that meet in the center. This is pre-maxilla. So now here, primary palate, again, to just revise quickly, upper lip, alveolar ridge, and when does it develop? Four to eighth week of gestation, okay? And it should be completed by the 12th week with the secondary palate formation. Secondary palate is the final palate. So now here it gives rise to the hard, soft palate. It develops between this week of gestation, 4 to uh, 8 to 12th week of gestation. So here it can be interrupted by various outside, you know, um, uh, ailments like you have abnormal genetic conditions could be uh, prevailing or it could be environmental agents called the tetragens. So these could also interrupt the smooth development of the face and the palate. So now in that case, what can happen? There could be incomplete cleft palate. There could also include the lip along with the palate unilaterally or it could also include it bilaterally along with the palate. So all these probabilities are there. Okay, so now here, if it includes the cleft lip, what is cleft lip? Why is it happening? It is because of M and M. Okay, because of non-fusion of these two. Cleft palate is because of when palatal shelves, they fail to fuse in the midline. And that can also include the cleft lip. Okay, whenever this deformity is there, there could also be cleft lip. Cleft lip and cleft palate, these are again very relative terms. Okay, it's just like deaf and the dumb. So these cleft lip person will also probably have cleft palate and vice versa. And in Native Americans, the rate is much more higher compared to the other, you know, geographical religions. So this is the development of tongue next. That was about the palate. Now this is the tongue. You can see what you can see. You can see the lingual swells you can see. 
and right in the center the big thing is tuberculum in part so that three things will give rise to lingual swellings plus tuberculum in part will give rise to anterior two third of the tongue but who will give rise to posterior one third it will be by a small portion small portion from the hypobranchial eminence so hypobranchial eminence has a um, front portion and a portion at the back which is called the cranial and the caudal part okay cranial and the caudal part the cranial part is going to give rise to the posterior one third of tongue and the caudal part will give rise is root of the tongue and shades that is the root of the tongue so this is this one is the posterior one third so this is cranial this is caudal so hypobranchial eminence is actually going to be the derivative from the fourth arch third and fourth arch the cranial part third arch the caudal part fourth arch all the muscles are from the occipital somite there are intrinsic extrinsic muscles you can see that they are connective tissue also they're all from the occipital myotropes so you have to remember there is also a remnant that is called foramen cecum that actually represents where the thyroid tissue started its development and then it descends down into the neck and then it forms the thyroid lobes right and left lobes and here you can see the embryology of thyroid if you look at you can see the pharyngeal pouches arches then you can see that uh, you know pharyngeal uh, sorry the thyroglossal duct developing so that is exactly where the junction is there between the second and the third one so here you can see the diverticulum and then it drops down into the neck and sometimes there could also be a small site of atrophy also could be seen okay so there the thyroid tissue um, is supposed to start obliterating or sometimes it may even persist and it may give rise to an extra lobe called pyramidal lobe so if this pyramidal lobe is present then it will connect it to the hyoid bone above otherwise how can it hang in the neck just like that like a stick it has to be connected somewhere so it is connected to the hyoid bone by what ligament there is a ligament which connects it anybody knows what is the name of this ligament what is the name of that ligament falguni you know what glandule thyroid a levator glandule thyroid a so that's how the thyroid will descend down into the neck opposite the cricoid cartilage and it will extend up to the oblique line oblique line that you can see here on the thyroid cartilage thyroid cartilage has got an oblique line up to there the lobes will extend otherwise it has the isthmus right in the center against two second third and fourth tracheal rings tracheal rings okay and the lobes will extend up to the thyroid cartilage so this is how the pyramidal lobe is seen and you can see that that is a pyramidal lobe how it can be connected to the tongue for some time and later on it can even have a, a connection removed from the tongue and this will represent it be as a foramen cecum and there could be always some amount of thyroid tissue just present in the neck without any you know particular aim so it may not secrete anything but it there could be persistent ectopic thyroid tissue also all right or like any other lobe the thyroid lobe from the lobe itself you may see an extension that is called pyramidal lobe so this is considered to be fine but these are all abnormal
okay this is not this is not going to pose any uh, danger it is just fine but lingual goiter then ectopic thyroid tissue all may you know result in um, you know kind of excessive tissue scattered around the neck and it may also be uh, felt from surface so this is how it will look and it can even turn into cyst so thyroglossal duct what is thyroglossal duct it is actually epithelial lines that means it secretes so the build up of secretions are a possibility so it it has epithelium lining and it will definitely secrete and it when it fails to regress it can give rise to cyst or fistulae formation okay so now here thyroglossal cyst and fistulae are usually treated with complete excision of the gland itself and recurrence is very very limited it is just 2.5% of population may have recurrence of the same uh, condition and here you can see if it is uh, you know left untreated it can also produce discharge out of the duct and it can be occurring around the sides and anterior part of the neck so that is another nuisance that could be seen in the neck okay now coming to the some uh, quiz rapid quiz now tell me this one upper four incisors originate from now this i had told you upper four incisors where do you think it is originating from all of you heard me that time upper four what we were talking about palate remember we're talking about palate media the primary palate secondary palate primary palate gives rise is given by sorry the primary palate is by the medial nasal process and secondary palate is by which one by the maxilla maxillary process so we were talking about the four incisors and that is present on the primary palate and it is by the medial nasal process so the answer is d okay yes it is not by maxilla maxilla is secondary process secondary palate now second one during the development of face palatal shells there are two shells right and left they arise from maxillary prominence we know know that which structure is formed from fusion of the palatal shells shells what structure is it soft secondary bridge of the nose bridge of the nose no it is by fronto nasal process very clearly lower jaw is by mandibular process secondary palate so answer is b okay <clears throat> next one the primitive mouth i marked it and i said what it is called primitive mouth what is it called it is called stomatodium okay next one what is the name given to area of the tongue which marks the origin of thyroid gland there are various foramen in the cranial cavity also it may have same name just like we people have same names many of us have same names sometimes boys and girls names also will be same i have one student uh, whose name is rama there is one boy rama there is one girl rama like that so the answer here is foramen cecum this is not the cecum that is present in the cranial cavity this is a different cecum this is on the tongue okay on the lingual surface of the tongue so that is foramen cecum so now here below it's an illustration of developing tongue okay so which structure forms the mucus of the posterior one third of the tongue posterior one third of the tongue yes i told you very clearly hypobranchial eminence has two parts cranial and the caudal part so it is the b answer 
hypobranchial eminence don't uh, get confused with tuberculum impar it is still the anterior portion okay still the anterior portion all right next a child is seen in post primary care with midline lump in the neck thyroglossal duct is suspected what is the role of this duct in the development what does that do extra lobe it sub which supplies additional t3 to the developing embryo thyroglossal duct no it marks the descent of thyroid gland into the neck very simple english very neatly given this is not the one no infundibulum of the forebrain comes to thyroid gland they are trying to confuse you with which gland with the pituitary right pituitary forebrain they're trying to confuse you with the development of pituitary next it forms the intrinsic muscles of the tongue what are the intrinsic muscles of the tongue tell me who knows name the intrinsic muscles of the tongue extrinsic everybody will tell which are the intrinsic ones akil intrinsic muscles of the tongue there are they are vertical and longitudinal muscles okay next coming to the pituitary gland development we have a development of pituitary we have floor of the forebrain here roof of the stomatodium okay stomatodium forms a nice uh, pouch like structure it elongates upwards and loses connection with the roof of the stomatodium to form a anterior lobe this is the anterior lobe so ultimately what forms the anterior lobe the radial pouch how did you get from the stomatodium okay that is anterior pituitary so now the posterior wall will remain still patent and it forms the pars intermedia then there is lumen that is present it becomes obliterated actually there is anterior wall is greatly you know thickened and that forms pars distalis anterior wall is called pars distalis it upward extensions to form the pars tuberalis pars tuberalis okay so this is what you can see in the development of the pituitary very very important so this is how you have to remember only the important ones you have to remember because you are definitely you are going to give more you know prominence to those words keywords and with keywords you are going to recall so please remember the keywords from this topic rat case pouch what does it give rise to anterior so you can write it down like this rat case pouch will give rise to anterior pituitary just like summary at the end of the class then forebrain will give rise to posterior pituitary so that's the reason forebrain since this is associated with the this is also called neurohypophysis okay this is controlled by the hypothalamus okay this is anterior pituitary so anterior pituitary is asked so many times because of the word rath case pouch most of you would forget this name rath case pouch all right okay so now here this one interesting thing langmans embryo every section it can be done yeah it can be done is all the head and neck sections is it we need many many hours i have uh, some 18 hours where i'll finish langmans yeah we, i can i can pick up few um, good topics and i can you have any topic that you want to learn you tell me those topics on the event that is better than doing everything head and neck because in this head and neck section these are the important things you should not let go that's why 
so need pg combat how many of you are writing or are you all writing did you all register it is on 10th of october at 11 am please register fast it is not going to put you into any trouble because you are only going to uh, feel happy after writing this test because either you will get a subscription but if you already have a subscription you will be able to definitely assess yourself you will be able to assess yourself okay how many hours head and neck um, finish we don't have any particular number of hours for head and neck our hours are divided as uh, plus hours and we have special class hours and youtube hours okay we have uh, 60 hours divided between these three and they have we have some other hours which are promotional hours so that is how it is divided so there is no particular head and neck uh, thing but special i will have some uh, either 12 or 18 hours that i will have to use most of the time on wednesdays because wednesday is the day for special class yeah i will have to cover in that case yeah so this is 10th october 11 am have you registered murli please register enroll and this is the code use the code and we'll also get to know that you have registered using the code so that is one interesting i will know how many of my students registered with my code so that will give me motivation so that's the reason you have all these ranking systems where you will get the scholarships okay it's really really interesting keeps you motivated to study this is plus subscription and you have um, access to many things here and you also have uh, printed notes with this and you can see you have features like raise a hand and um, you can get personalized and highly you know interactive live class experience with the educators why embryology is as it is yes i know there are some topics which are really really i completely agree with you embryology is definitely going to make anyone bored for sure and uh, i also know the surface anatomy this is something in uh, in my college they had given me surface anatomy because most of the students said that they don't want to look at surface anatomy because they get bored so we played a game and we learned all the surface anatomy topics all the what we did have you watched this movie gajini the this movie you know and he um, writes on his body so like that we wrote all over the body we marked the points we connected and somehow we learned the surface anatomy topics so that was the type i we studied so there is various methods to teach and learn right so you have to just learn that art so now here there is a mission inict 2021 and uh, you also have this clinical examination features so yeah you know um, enroll and uh, get to know all these fast paced educators you can see so many of them are there all right then you can also see uh when you have uh, enrolled for this special classes this is how you can get into the special class by um you know going through all those steps when you bump into this step people don't know what to do so they will uh, they will call me and ask what next so this is how you should you have to just notify me you have to click on that notify me and then uh, you have to get into this screen this is a pop up screen where you can you know go and enter the code roini chat okay that is the unlock code once you load you will be able to get into my classes by because or uh, you will get notified about the class so these are uh, some of the profile you know um, things that you can see you also get all these uh, hats you can see and uh, you can see that there are so many followers okay you can also be one of the follower then there is iconic subscription and the plus subscription so this is of iconic where you have access to the an academy as well as the prep ladder all right so here is the special class features 
and you can see all these features are there in special classes which you don't have in uh, the YouTube, right? The YouTube classes are not that interactive compared to the special classes. So here you can watch this anytime, anywhere. You can also download the PDF notes and you will never miss a class because you will be getting all the notifications. Yeah, raise a hand feature is there. That is the thing that you always use, right, Murli? I have uh, been very impressed with raise a hand because we can interact, we can ask questions. That is really interesting. Okay, next you can see that there are QBank series and we also have some limited time offer with the various subscriptions and you can also see the proud star learners here. And target next integrated batches you can see. And these are clinical examinations batch. And you can also see some boost your medical PG preparation with the, so many freebies. You can go for 24 plus 4, 12 plus 2, etc. And here is the EMI option. And you can go with the either iconic or plus and go with the EMI. And this is a code you should use. I'll come up with more genetic in YouTube you not know, special classes for um, embryology and genetic topics. So I hope that will sound good to you. All right, see you all. I'm Dr. Roini. See you all very soon in the evening again with the Apple Lim flashcard, okay, at 7 p.m. So see you at 7 p.m. today. Bye, take care.